So first off, Amy, I know you had a massage, so you are feeling hunky-dory and excited to talk about SIBO root causes. Yeah, Which I'm shall zen. we take a deep dive on first, my dear? Dealer's choice. Yeah, let's do let's do low stomach acid PPIs. I think that's a great one to dive into. This one could be mighty controversial, right? And Lord knows yeah. the GI world loves to prescribe PPIs. They give them out like candy. Um, and I do think that that's a huge problem that a lot of people might not need them. I think that there are cases where if you have a geyser of a bleeding ulcer, as my mom once had, that's that's a case where maybe a PPI is appropriate as part of the the treatment of that. Yeah. But I think that they are prescribed very willy nilly. And it drives me bonkers that now you can see what is it? Prilosec is available over the counter and you can just pick it up at any Costco, Walgreens, Walmart. Where it's like, oh, you have a gut issue of any sort. Why don't you try PPIs first? Which to me, again, some of them are not situations where PPIs should yeah. be prescribed, in my opinion. You know, it's bloating or like SIBO, IBS type symptoms, like diarrhea, and they're prescribing PPIs. And there's nothing really indicating a PPI would be effective. And it's mm-hmm. just a very knee jerk. And I think a lot of like general practitioners do it too when people come in with general GI discomfort they'll just be like well let's try a PPI first before we do anything else and it's like try a PPI and then refer to a gastro I feel like it's the general trend that I see but um I I do think I agree with what you're saying it being a controversial controversial topic as I know we've said in previous podcasts there was a lot of meta-analysis and studies confirming or more correlating that, you know, PPIs lead to higher risk of SIBO. But then you have newer studies that are saying, no, they don't, no. or saying mm-hmm. like there's not a correlation. I, I think even like the newer Mark Pimentel study was saying, you know, there's not as much correlation with change of small intestinal microbiota with PPI. It's a very, I think, weird um weird topic and you don't know if there's like powers that be i don't want to be a conspiracy theorist here oh i'll go there if you don't want to go there okay for sure like good i mean i I think i would guess if you dug deep enough you could find that some of them had conflicting interests or or ties with these studies that are saying no bro you're good because that does seem to be the consistent theme in more recent studies is now you're good keep taking the ppi i do think like even if for some reason there was no correlation, which I think there's a lot of evidence and just understanding how the GI GI function works. Like it doesn't make sense that there wouldn't be a correlation, but even if, you know, let's say that there isn't a higher risk of SIBO taking PPIs, there's still tons of reasons not to take PPIs as well. Totally. So I feel like there's this kind of attitude too, where it's like, oh, these PPIs are totally fine now, like, you know, to take for people with SIBO, like go for it. But then it's like, mm-hmm. okay, you might not get SIBO, but you might get all these nutrient deficiencies, higher risk of infections, oh, yeah. like all these other issues that come along with PPIs like it's not optimal to be on PPIs long term regardless of it if it's correlated to SIBO or not that's a frustrating part too because I feel like in some of the studies I'm reading it's like oh yeah like thank god it's not correlated because now everyone could be on these PPIs if they need it and I'm like yes they're like what you were saying there's definitely a time and place for PPIs but man the the amount that are typically used is is way overkill. It's yeah, I think that they are over prescribed. And even if you, you know, if your prescriber prescribes a PPI, there also needs to be a conversation of, okay, so am I on this for the rest of my life? Or is there a game plan to come off of it? And I do find that it's not explicitly said, oh hey, this is a forever thing. Now going to the ridiculous scenario of, okay, if you have a 30 year old who's on a PPI, is she going to stay on that until she's 98? Like, is that the goal here? Because if you're not having a conversation of some sort of strategy to get off of it, then that's kind of the implication that that person's going to be on it until the day they die, which is preposterous. I really, truly believe in my heart of hearts that this is a true SIBO root cause to the point where I have questions about it on all of my paperwork for all new patients. 
Um, I've talked about it on my online class quite a bit. There was a nice study. It's an oldie but goodie now, but it's a 2012 study, and it's titled Proton Pump Inhibitor Use and the Risk of Small Intestinal Bacterial Overgrowth, a Meta-Analysis. Mm-hmm. And in this study, they said particularly... Um, subgroup analysis revealed an association between SIBO and PPI use in studies that use duodeno or jejunal aspirate cultures to diagnose SIBO, but no relationship was found between SIBO and PPI use in studies that used glucose hydrogen breath tests. Well, A, are they only testing for hydrogen and not methane? Because that seems to be the, part of the implication. Mm-hmm. B, it breath tests, that might not be the best way to assess for SIBO. So they're saying that if you you know, if you use the better test, which isn't super useful for us, like I'm not going to send people out for an aspirate, but it does paint the picture of, oh, well, maybe it is associated, but some of these newer studies might not be addressing this. And they even say right in the conclusion, PPI use was statistically associated with SIBO risk, but only when the diagnosis was made by a highly accurate test, duodeno or jejunal aspirate culture. So, you know, that's something to chew on, too, is that, you know, are they are they taking into account the type of testing? Maybe there's been a whole slew of new studies in the last two, three, four years that have been funded by or influenced by the pharmaceutical companies. And now we're mixing all of that in with the previous data. And now it's looking like it's not statistically significant. But if they're not looking for the bias in the publications that they're using for the meta-analysis, then that kind of goes out the window. And the meta-analysis is not very useful. Now, is it? Research which is highly influenced by and funded by Big Pharma, I would be highly suspicious whenever they tell you, no, bro, keep taking your drug. You're good. Wink. Yeah. Just from a understanding of how the gut works, I don't know how you can explain away how a PPI wouldn't affect the small intestines like because there's so many downstream effects that come from the ph Mm -hmm. of the stomach so if the ph of the stomach is not low like it should be like your stomach acid is is low essentially if you're taking a ppi because it's it's going to limit your stomach acid if your stomach acid's low you're going to have less uh, or a higher ph chyme which is Mm -hmm. coming out of the stomach and when you have a higher pH, which basically means like low acid um, base. Yeah, like a neutral, like yeah. a neutral pH, closer to seven. Yeah, closer to a neutral pH. pH. When that's coming out of the stomach, you're not going to get, you know, bile flow or bile release. You're not going to get uh, pancreatic enzyme release. You're mm-hmm. not going to potentially get MMC and motility processes running oh, either yeah. if the stomach acid's low. So I just don't understand how it could not be connected just from a yeah. basic understanding of of how the gut works. Oh, yeah. And I think in the last podcast, we busted out some of the nutritional deficiencies. I mean, B12, iron, mm-hmm. magnesium, I mean, practically anything is up for grabs because that's where digestion starts. Really, I mean, like it starts in the mouth and even before you put the food in your mouth, but a lot of the enzymatic processes really start with that acidic stomach and you're breaking down that food. And I also don't get, you know, I don't get how PPI use and stomach acid, you know, um, becoming less acidic. I don't see how that couldn't be involved with SIBO, A, because of just baseline human anatomy and physiology knowledge, but also microbiology. Like, I didn't love my microbiology class in undergrad, but I think I remember enough to think that microbes <laughs> care about pH yeah, quite a lot. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> like, yeah. So you're going to favor the growth of different kinds of bacteria. Clinically, I've definitely seen cases where, A, the patient is struggling with SIBO, and, you know, they've done antimicrobials, they've done Zyfaxin, they've done whatever, and nothing seems to stick until we get them off the PPI. And in some cases, get the stomach acid boosted. And we get them on things like betaine HCL, or we get them chewing their damn food. So there have been plenty of cases where, you know, people feel stuck. And I'm the first person to go, maybe we should get you off the PPI. Let's talk to your prescriber about that, because you've got to do it safely. But here's some licorice and stuff. Here's some herbs to help coat the stomach. Here, let's work on the root causes. And then that gets the ball rolling. And then they're finally able to get over their SIBO when literally nothing else has worked. And then similarly, I've had cases, and one comes to mind right now, one of my favorite patients, 
relapsed and got diagnosed with SIBO again because she went back on a PPI. And I, I, I was like wanting to shake her through the telephone when I saw her on my schedule. I was like, <laughs> and I could call her because I would tell her the story. I'm like, Suzanne, why are you calling me? Why are we on the phone right now? And she's like, oh, Dr. D, I got diagnosed with SIBO again and I'm constipated, the methane's back. I'm like, but what, like, what's been going on? And she happened to mention, you know, two, three, four months prior to calling me, she got some reflux. She went to her GI doctor. They prescribed a PPI. She was on it for about two months. Boom, the SIBO came back. Mm-hmm. And now here we are. And I'm like, okay, so goal one is we're getting you off of that safely with your prescriber, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, that's goal number one. And then we'll talk about treating the SIBO. Why didn't you call me? <laughs> and I gave her so much shit for not calling me first. But um, I have seen patients, and she's not the only one, but she's the one that comes to mind, where people do seem to relapse and get SIBO again after they get back on a PPI. And I even had one case where it seemed to happen with Zantac too. But I think, you know, I've seen enough of those cases.